Here, a man called Abu Abbas, Abu Al Abbas, took power and uh, he formed what is known as the Abbasid dynasty. That didn't last even 10 years. Eventually, another man, a very powerful man, Abdul Rahman, took control and the Umayyad dynasty was reinstated. And that went on for a long time. Now note the invasion of Europe by Africans. The Africans never once interfered with the language of the Spanish or the Portuguese. They did not take away their laws or their courts. They did not reduce them to state of slavery where they were second class citizens. The only thing they insisted on since religion was so important that they should have a say in the election of their bishops. And they did not as the Europeans did to us because people like to tell you, you know, that we made slaves of other people, so what are we talking about? Study closely what happened in when we invaded other people. We did not destroy European civilization, we gave it something. The Europeans totally destroyed what they found. Instead of adding to it and having a blend of things, they destroyed what they found in their arrogance and their greed. Trade prospered and flourished tremendously in Spain and Portugal as a result of the Moors. The Moors introduced a range of industries. They introduced masses of fruits and vegetables from all over the world. And above all, note this, there were only two universities in Europe at the time the Moors invaded. Do you know that at the end of the, that, by the 12th century, this invasion was done in the 8th century, around 711 AD, the Africans and Arabs invaded Europe. The Africans and Arabs introduced 17 universities into Europe. The Europeans only had two. At the time of the invasion, Europe was 99% illiterate. The Muslims made it compulsory for children to have education. You always hear about illiterate Africans and about how they can't write, etc. There are only a few European tribes who created scripts. A lot of us take for granted, you see all the Europeans are writing today, many of us in various parts of the world are called illiterate, but many European tribes had no, the English have never invented a script. The script you use is not English script. The English do not have a script, those are English songs. The Romans, another white people gave the English script. There are only a few European scripts, the Romans had a script, which they gave the French and the Spanish and the English and so on. They didn't have scripts. They were illiterates. The Greeks had a script. The Romans had a script. The Russians had a script. The Phoenicians had a script and the Phoenic part of the Phoenician script is Africa. Even the Ogham script that you find among the Celts, it's been established now that that is half African. The Africans had several scripts. The Africans created the Egyptian hieroglyphic script. The Africans created the Meroitic script, which Diop helped to decode before he died. The Africans created the Akan script, both a drum script and a written script. The Africans created the Manding script. The Africans created the Afaka script. The Africans created the Arabic script. So don't tell me about we are the illiterates. We have become illiterate. It is not that we are inferior. We have been inferiorized. Yeah. The whole point of this kind of history and the reason why it takes on such passionate advocacy because when I speak at white schools and I, I notice I'm speaking more and more to white schools, I'm, I last February I used to startle every time I appear at an audience about half of my audiences that I appeared at there are about ten black people and two three hundred whites they want to know what's going on you see and they're not getting away because I don't modify what I have to say 
Because once it's on scientific ground, you can say it and they will listen. I entered a college, for example, Centenary College in New Jersey. I don't know who learned about me, but I was invited to speak. Boy, there's not a single black on that campus. There has never been in the 20th century. And they came, some of them with sneering faces, especially the teachers. But when they listened, there wasn't the damn thing they could say because they have nothing they could throw back at me. I spoke at the agricultural station in, um, this is one of the, one of the only station we have in the United States that deals with animal diseases. It protects against animal diseases. I was told I had to sign a document that I would not touch livestock for one week. Because they say that when I leave that station, I will carry viruses on me, but it would not affect me as a human being, but if I touch an animal, it would affect animals. So I said, I have a dog. They said, well, it doesn't affect dogs and cats and humans. It affects livestock. You can't go on a farm. And I had to travel on a boat to this island. This is a secret science island in New York. And when I got into this, big laboratory with all these scientists. I saw on the wall a big thing with diseases in the world and I saw um, rinder pest um, originated in Africa. And I said in my speech when I came to deal with medicine and diseases, I said, by the way, I see you have this unfortunate error on your map, rinder pest. <laughs> Rhinopest was not created by Africans, it was created by Europeans. It was brought into Africa by Europeans. In fact, it led to disaster because where there were about five million head of cattle in that area and they all disappeared. And when I was finished, one of the scientists said, well, how could you say such a thing? And an argument began and the head of the agricultural station got up and said, yes, Van Sartre is true, it is a European disease. But he knew that, why didn't he change the map? You see, once you don't challenge them, they don't have to do anything. The impact of these dynasties, the third dynasty in particular, there are two dynasties that are very African. The first two are fairly mixed dynasties. But there's the Almoravid dynasty that enters Europe around 1086 AD. They say that the cavalry, the Senegalese cavalry, when the Europeans saw the Senegalese, by the way, some of you have perhaps are not very acquainted with the Senegalese. They're among the tallest people in the world. Average height, seven feet. Sitting on these Arabian steeds, could you imagine a seven foot, a whole army of seven foot men <laughs> charging down in the European battlefields? They turned and ran. <laughs> I have a picture on the cover of African Presence in Early Europe where you could see two African noblemen sitting down at the table playing chess. Um, this is 12th century Europe. At that time, and in the dynasty, the Umayyad dynasty too, the, the Moors introduced several things. Let me note these things because they're unique in Europe. The Moors introduced universities of uh, Europe having two ended up with 17 more from the Muslims alone. The Moors introduced a great number of new industries. They introduced rice, they introduced cotton, they introduced many of the spices, introduced sugar cane. They developed the silk industry. They developed tanneries, etc. The finest tanneries in the world, the finest swords in the world. The Moors introduced the first paved streets in Europe were introduced by the Moors. The first lighted streets in Europe were introduced by the Moors. The Moors introduced books from all over the world. Everything that was available in China which they had invaded, India which they had invaded, Persia, Greece, Rome, Egypt was brought into Spain, translated into Arabic, and then brought into Spain so that you could study it at the university. And furthermore, the Moors introduced air conditioning into Europe. 
then it wasn't the air conditioning we have today where you merely blow cool air into hot places or hot air into cold places. It was perfumed air conditioning. It was run over a bank of flowers. They introduced the first piped water. They would run lead pipes from the mountains down into the houses. Toilets. At a time when, and baths, public baths. Note this, not a single public bath. They had a few private baths. Not a single public bath existed in Spain and Portugal when the Moors came from Africa. They introduced hundreds of public baths. And they introduced also masses of public markets and public libraries. Only wealthy people in Europe had libraries, little private libraries. There was not a single public library in Europe when the Moors invaded. The Moors introduced many public libraries. Have you ever heard of the, what the, Euro, the Moors gave to the Europeans? Now that's pushed under the carpet. Do you read that? Do you hear anything about that in European civilization classes here in America? No, sir. Don't want to hear about those darkies. They never did anything. That is what the slave trade did to us. It's not only the reduction of the human being in physical terms. Our history was systematically wiped out. So that blacks today, even their own, our own people, are spreading lies about us. When I was in the Caribbean in Trinidad, and I've been to Trinidad several times to give lectures, you get two totally different responses. There's a girl of 14 years old in the high school, after I finished speaking on blacks and science, this girl came up to me, why are you lying to these people? My mother said, you're full of lies. We never did these things. You're making it up. This is 14 years old, you know. She's already been bombed and blasted. Can't operate because her mother tells her, you're not to believe these things. The white people did it all for you. We have to start from scratch. And then the other thing, the, the, the day later I'm speaking at uh, the Trinidad um, in Port of Spain. You had, um, I'm speaking, and there's, there's a crowd of people, the call cannot hold the people, they stretch the streets and they have these microphones, relay of microphones. And a black man came up to me and pounded his head on the table until it bled, crying. He said, this is the first day I am proud to be a black man. This is a, a guy in his 60s, you know. That is what has happened to us. And when you see these things, you cannot but for the rest of your life feel rage. You can't just enter into these studies with, just like other scholars do, some sort of dry, dull as dust bookworm. I'm no bookworm. I'm in deeply involved because you begin to realize that this knowledge is life to our people. And in those prisons, in those prisons when you see men who have lost all hope, suddenly they light, there is light in their eyes. You see it like if you were looking at the early Christians. There is light in the eyes because that new knowledge becomes almost a religious fire. This is what keeps us alive. Because if we did not have this new knowledge, often we would be filled with a darkness so great it would utterly overwhelm us. This is the kind of knowledge that overturned the Roman Empire. And many people think, oh yes, well how are you going to do anything with this? We don't have any guns. We can't do anything. Look at South Africa. You know South Africa has the atomic bomb? Don't let them fool you. Sheikh Anthony up told me that the Israelis gave the South Africans material to produce one of the most advanced atomic bombs. And they feel so proud and arrogant they could do what the hell they like because of the, the Africans open their mouth, they just put the bomb on them. But that's not the way it's going to happen. That is what it looked like on paper. That's what it looks like on paper. You know, if you put things down and just share statistics, it looks as if we lost. When, when I was a boy, if you had put all the facts down and share statistics, the British would have, the empire would have existed for the rest of this century. Where the hell is it now? When I landed in Britain, they, all they had was oceans and islands. They were ruling the fish. 
<laughs> because 